Good morning and welcome to our service this morning, brought to you by Teambridge Methodist Churches. And this morning is going to be led by Sharon Herlow, and it's the first week of Here Is Your God, entitled Whose Is the Glory? So over to you, Sharon. So as Carol said, we're um, starting this week, a five-week series based on the book of Isaiah. And I hear people say, why are we doing Isaiah when we've just had Easter? But the lovely thing about the book of Isaiah is that he points all of the time to the coming of Jesus, to the death of Jesus and the resurrection. He can, points all the time to the glory that is God. So we're going to start a five-week series. And as we say, the first week this week is called Whose is the Glory? So we are going to still ourselves for a moment before we come before our God to worship. In Isaiah 40, there is a key verse that you will hear more than once during the next five weeks. It says this, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Lift up your voice with a shout, lift it up, do not be afraid. Say in a loud voice to all who will hear, hear is your God. Here is your God. So we're going to open this morning with our first hymn, Thine Be the Glory.
So let us pray together. Risen Lord, you revealed yourself to Mary on that first Easter Sunday morning at dawn. And we pray that you reveal yourself to us in the dawnings, the beginnings, the start of new things in our lives. Risen Lord, you revealed yourself to the fisher folk as they toiled in vain at their work. Reveal yourself to us, we pray, in the long hours of our labour. Risen Lord, you re revealed yourself to the walkers, the walkers on the Emmaus Road, as they welcomed you into their home. Reveal yourself to us as we walk and make you welcome wherever we live. Risen Lord, you revealed yourself to Thomas when he felt the scars of your body. Reveal yourself to us as we reach out to the scars of this world. Risen Lord, you revealed yourself to many as they met beneath the skies. Reveal yourself to us, we pray, in the wonder of your creation. Risen Lord, you turned Mary's tears to joy. Do the same with ours, we pray. Turn our tears to joy. You turned the traveller's despair into hope. Turn our despair to hope, Lord. Risen Lord, you turned the disciples' fears into total boldness. Take away our fears. Make us bold for you, we pray. Risen Lord, you emptied, you turned an empty cash into fullness. Turn our empty routines into something full and worthwhile. And Lord, you turn Thomas's unbelief into total trust in you. Help us, Lord, with our unbelief. Help us with our doubts and help us to trust in you. Lord, there are so many times that we fail you. There are so many times that we rest on our own strength and our own abilities, our own emotions. Lord, help us. Help us to stand strong in you. Help us to be the people that you need us to be in this broken world. Amen. So as we come to our second hymn now, we are going to lift up his name with the sound of singing, singing holy, holy, holy. <laughs>
Our first reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 3 to 15, and it's taken from the New Living Translation. In that wonderful day when the Lord gives his people rest from sorrow and fear, from slavery and chains, you will taunt the king of Babylon. You will say, the mighty man has been destroyed. Yes, your insolence is ended. For the Lord has crushed your wicked power and broken your evil rule. You struck the people with endless blows of rage and held the nations in your angry grip with unrelenting tyranny. But finally, the earth is at rest and quiet. Now it can sing again. Even the trees of the forest, the cypress trees and the cedars of Lebanon sing out this joyous song. Since you have been cut down, no one will come now to cut us down. In the place of the dead, there is excitement over your arrival. The spirits of world leaders and mighty kings long dead stand up to see you. With one voice they all cry out, now you are as weak as we are. Your might and power were buried with you. The sound of the harp in your palace has ceased. Now maggots are your sheet and worms your blanket. How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you, your, for you said yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountains of the gods far away in the north. I will climb the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians 4, commencing to read at verse 14. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit and as god's grace reaches more and more people there will be great thanksgiving and god will receive more and more glory that is why we never give up though our bodies are dying our spirits are being renewed every day all our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Amen. We now sing, Behold Our God. Adore him, behold. 
share with you would you just please pray with me Lord we want to come before you and say here is our God behold our God so Lord we just pray this morning Lord that as we share and as we hear Lord reveal yourself to us reveal your purposes to us we pray in Jesus name amen I wonder if any of you remember this song, which I won't sing it because you won't love it. The song goes, reach for the stars, climb every mountain higher, reach for the stars, follow your heart's desire. And so spoke one of the greatest prophets of our age, the pop group S Club 7. They were really popular with my daughter, or at least they were when she was about 12. The lyrics, though, capture a common trait of human nature. We long to reach for the stars. We want to be top of the league, top of the class, top of the tree, best in show. We climb the career ladder or we clamber up the property ladder. We want to rise. And perhaps we feel that desire because we have an inbuilt sense that we are fallen, even if we don't always admit it. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden had everything, but decided 
it was not enough. They went their own way and they lost it all. And we've been re trying to reclaim the glory that we once had ever since. We have tried to scramble back up to the top throughout history. Now, we were made in the image of God to reflect his glory in the world, to walk with God, to talk with God. But we rejected God and we came tumbling down. Not content to reflect God's glory, we want to establish a glory of our own. But we do it without God since the fall in the Garden of Eden. And so, as S Club 7 go on to say, we can't stop. Got to keep moving. Got to keep building. It's a relentless and exhausting endeavour that leaves us restless and anxious and really quite lost. The message that Isaiah brings us in chapters 13 to 25 of his Old Testament book is that all our efforts, all our strivings are futile. That human glory is always fleeting. It is always temporary. And Isaiah was in a really good position to state this fact. He could make a comparison because in Isaiah 6, he is given the privilege of seeing a vision of God. And he describes it for us. And it became the defining moment for his life and for his ministry. Isaiah in the vision is taken into the throne room of God. And there he sees the reality of God's holiness. He sees the wings of angels as they cover their eyes and their feet in the almighty presence of God. He hears from their lips, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, as heaven's voices sing in constant praise to God. He feels the holiness of God as the doorposts shake, and he smells the holiness of God as a smoke fills the temple. He witnesses the unparalleled grandeur of heaven with emerald courts and sapphire skies. He is aware of the Lord high and lifted up, high and exalted. He senses with everything in his body the supremacy of God's power. He is dumbstruck by Christ in his glory, and he acknowledges Christ as king. And now in chapter 20, I'm sorry, chapter 14, Isaiah sees another king who has set his sights far too high. Isaiah sees the king of Babylon, who is rich and mighty, and has built a mighty empire, a city established in opposition to God, an enemy to Israel. And Isaiah, being a prophet, foretells how in 200 years' time, 200 years into the future of when he writes, this empire will bring about the defeat of Jerusalem and all God's people will be taken into exile. But Isaiah also tells of the downfall of this king and this empire. In the, the passage that Carol read for us, we see the king of Babylon pictured as a star. How you have fallen from heaven. You have been cast down to earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realms of the dead, to the depths of the pit. The king of Babylon reached for the stars, but now his star 
is fallen. This king, Belshazzar, was not the first to reach for the stars, not the first to try and make themselves like God. Satan, he tried to take God's place. Humanity followed trying to do the same thing, does the same thing even now. Babylon, in this vision, this reading that we've had, is just the latest manifestation of Babel. Now, Babel was the ancient city in which humanity came together to build a tower that would reach to the heavens. They thought that they could do it. They really came into this project thinking that they could reach heaven. It could come from the S Club 7 songbook, really, couldn't it? But in judgment, God thwarts their plans by sending a multitude of languages to confuse and confound them. And Belfazar was not the latest either. He wasn't the last. The point is this, that no matter how far your star rises, no matter how high you climb, in the end, you are brought down. Every great king becomes a dead king. Every mighty man becomes a weak man. And I was reminded yesterday of how when we watched the funeral of the late queen on the television, how I was very deeply touched at the moment that they removed her crown from her coffin. I don't know whether you felt the same thing, but the reality that this mighty lady, this lovely lady, she was stripped of what made her queen and she became just human. She became human just like anybody else. The people whose status we look up to, the people whose status we can perhaps envy, will one day be just like everybody else. We so easily get in, sucked into thinking that human glory and status are what matters. But you know, that's insane. It was literally insane in the case of Belshazzar's grandfather, who was Nebuchadnezzar. He became insane when he thought he'd made it, when he put himself so high that he thought he was higher than God. Nebuchadnezzar once declared, is this not this great Babylon, this great city that I have built? I have built it as my royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Now, God would judge Nebuchadnezzar for his pride and he would lose his mind, live like an animal and be driven away by his people. He only became sane again when he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth. And this is true sanity, believing that God is God and we are human, believing that our lives are not in our hands, but in his. And of course, we can affect the course of our lives. We are not mere puppets with no initiative and no responsibility. But can we really fully control our wealth, our health, our family, our future. Sanity is found when we recognize that God is in control. When it was, when it defeated Jerusalem, when Babylon defeated Jerusalem in 587 BC, just as Isaiah predicted years and years before, Babylon was the largest city in the world. It was the first city in human history to exceed 
200,000 people seems small compared with today, but in those days it was huge. And where is this mighty city today? Where is it? It is a ruin in the desert, just as Isaiah said it would be in his prophecy. Some of these ruins can still be seen in modern day Iraq though. And having not learned the lesson of yesteryear, we see something remarkable. In 1983, Saddam Hussein started to rebuild the ancient city of Babylon, portraying himself as a new Nebuchadnezzar. He had his name inscribed on each and every brick built and used in the project, just as Nebuchadnezzar used to do. He had a large portrait of himself alongside Nebuchadnezzar put up at the entrance. Signs throughout the city declared this was built by Saddam Hussein, son of Nebuchadnezzar, to glorify Iraq by my name. And yet today, once again, the city of Babylon, the city that Nebuchadnezzar built, the city that Saddam Hussein rebuilt, is just a ruin in the desert. Since that first act of defiance in the Garden of Eden, humanity has idolized wealthy, powerful, or beautiful individuals. We listen to their opinions, excuse me, and we want to know about their lives. We want to be like them and have the things that they have. Or alternatively, we can fear powerful people, worry about what they will do next. Powerful people chasing their dreams of glory can be a real threat to others, can't it? As we can see by watching our news channels right now. And yet we know that human glory, status and success are temporary at best. We don't need Isaiah to tell us this. We just need to go to any rubbish tip or any graveyard and there we have evidence. There we will see the future of all the stuff that we covet and the glory, the future of the glory that we crave. As we stand in the rubbish tip or at the graveyard, seeing all of human glory rotting away, let us listen to God's words. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3. All of us who contemplate the Lord's glory can reflect that glory as the Lord makes us more and more like him, as we are changed into his glorious image. With God is the glory that does not rot away or tumble down. God's glory is an ever increasing glory. And it also belongs to us. God wishes to bestow that on us as he changes us. God, Paul knows that God's glory will not rot away as human glory does. He acknowledges that we are all, every single one of us, wasting away. But he is able to view human fragility as mere light and troubles as being momentary because he seeks glory in the right place. This is the glory of God. All we need to do is fix our eyes on him. Look at our troubles in the light of Christ and what you see. God easing our hearts out of that rubbish tip and showing us glory that will never fade. When I lived in Swansea, I had a pastor and he had this saying, which 
he kept repeating over and over again, which was, think of things in the light of eternity. In the light of eternity, what we do here is fleeting. And in God, there is a glory that we do not have to earn or create or build. It is the glory of God and he shares it willingly with us if we look in the right place. God's words continue through Paul. For God who said, let the light shine out of the darkness, he has made this light shine in our hearts so that we can know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus. We look into the face of Christ. That is where we see the glory of God. And that is the look that will transform us. So it all depends on where we look. Look at the adverts, the glossy magazines, the car on our neighbor's drive, and our hearts will be pulled towards human glory. Look at the rubbish tip or the graveyard, and we will see that human glory is a passing fancy. Look at the face of Christ, though, and we'll see the promise of eternal glory. And all this because when Jesus rose on that first Easter Sunday, Satan fell. When Jesus rose, death was defeated. When Jesus rose and he took his rightful place, he opened the way for us to rise with him. We have a God who didn't reach for the stars, for it was he who flung those stars into space and called them all by name. We have a God who was prepared to rescue us from ourselves and to give us the gift of salvation. We have a God who loves us so much that he wants us with him for eternity. We have a God who deserves the highest throne. We have a God who is truly worthy of all the glory, all the honour and all the praise. Whose is the glory? The glory is God's and his alone. Amen. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that we can come to know you. That as we realise, as Isaiah did, when he saw that first vision of you in your power and your might. Lord, as we begin to realise exactly who you are. Lord, we give you praise and we give you thanks. Lord, and we thank you too that you loved us so much that you want to share this with us. That as you rose, we can rise with you. As you will live forever, so will we. Lord, we come to you this morning, praising you, lifting your name high. For yours is the glory and ours is the praise to you. Amen. So we sing. And we sing again, there is a higher throne.
So we come now to our time of prayers and intercession. There is a response if you'd like to join in in your own homes. When after a prayer I say fill us with your love, the response is that the world may see your glory. Let us pray together. Creator God, we come before you, Lord, and we pray for the world. We pray for your world, created by love and lit up by your glory. We bring our world, spoilt by selfishness and sin, as people try to reach for the stars, as people try to manufacture a glory of their own. Lord, we pray for the world, its land ravaged, its waters polluted, its resources squandered. We pray for the world where people are governed unjustly, where its nations are torn apart by conflict and by war, where people are hungry and despairing and scared. Lord, we pray that we can see a vision of your world as you meant it to be. And that we, we that know you, can pray for and act towards restoring this world, this broken world, to the one that you created. Lord, fill us with your love, that the world may see your glory. Jesus, Saviour God, we pray for the world, your world where we may seek and know you, our world, a place of opportunity and of temptation, where we have choices to make as to which path we choose, as to whose glory we let aim to build and to look at. Lord, we pray for the rulers and the leaders of countries. We pray for those who are trying to serve their people well. We pray for communities that are divided by race or class or religion. Lord, help these places be a place of acceptance and not a place where those differences can divide. We pray for your church, witnessing to your gospel, your gospel of saving grace, saving love, witnessing to your glory if people would but look to you. And Lord, we pray for ourselves on our spiritual walk, on our pilgrimage through this life. Lord, we pray that we keep our eyes fixed in your direction. We pray that we can influence others that walk alongside us. Lord, that we can share you with them and help their load on their journey too. Lord, fill us with your love that the world may see your glory. And Holy Spirit, God of comfort, we pray for the world, your world that was filled with your presence, our world, a place of vulnerability and struggle. 
So Lord, we pray for all those who are vulnerable and struggling right now. We pray for all those who are ill, who are sorrowful, who are bereaved, all those who feel anxious about things in their life. We pray for those who no longer feel you in their lives, who have lost sight of you, who have lost their direction. We pray for those who are struggling with doubt, who need reassurance and guidance from you for the future. And Lord, for ourselves, we pray that you will fill us with your love, with your joy and with your peace. May we always know your presence with us. May we always have a vision of you in our minds. Lord, fill us with your love that the world may see your glory. Amen. And we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We have a God who has done great things and who will continue to do great things. So we sing our final song to him now. done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things he has done great things oh hero of heaven you conquered the grave and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. Be dancing your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Yes and amen, you will do great things, God you do great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Done great.
captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awaken the life oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great So thank you for joining us this morning. And before we leave, a blessing. May each of us see the glory that is seen in the face of Christ in every person we meet. And may everyone that we meet see the glory that is seen in the face of Christ in us. And the blessing of God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love today and always. Amen. So this service has been brought from you brought to you from the Team Bridge Methodist Church Circuit churches and we pray that you have been blessed by what you've heard today. If you wish to contact us there is an email address on the screen. If not, we just pray that you have a blessed week and we look forward to you joining us again.